Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 15 of Alex and Jim Analyze Billy Joel Lyrics. We do that. Yeah, we do. And then a lot watch of the other ones, then you'll see. Yeah, yeah. Mouthy. What, you said we didn't do it. We did it. Why are they like that? Why are, you being, like that? why are you being such jerks? We've done 15 of these sons of bitches. Professional audience. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing great. Yeah. The pandemic is not affecting us. No, yeah. It's... We're both still normal. Lord. Like we were before the pandemic. Yeah. My uh, my joke about the pandemic, my newest joke about the pandemic is you no hugs and you can't see people in person. If my dad were alive, he wouldn't know there was a pandemic going on. <laughs> <laughs> ah, great. And somebody would have to tell him, and I'm not calling him. Have to be one of you, brothers or sisters. <laughs> my dad famously, my dad famously, I'll tell you this and then we'll start this, famously chose when to die. Have I told you this before? Wow. My dad threw no. out. Did my he dad, kill himself? No. No, he willed himself. My dad throughout his life, my dad had wow. one leg. He beat pneumonia multiple times, moved to Arizona because his lungs were bad. Multiple times growing up, a doctor would tell us, well, he's okay now, but make him comfortable. I don't know if he'll make it. And then he'd get better and go back to work. And he did that wow. starting at the end of World War II, or decade <laughs> after decade, he would do that. My goodness. And doctors over and over would say to us, well, he's, you know, he's out of the woods, but he's probably not going to make it another year. They would say that to us. And eventually we just st stopped caring that they were telling us that because it just didn't mean anything. <laughs> sure. Then one time he got a little bit sick and he moved, he went to an old folks home and I talked to the doctor and they said, your dad's fine. Uh, he's going to be fine. And, uh, and then I talked to my dad and I said, he said, well, they tell me you can't live on your own anymore. And he always lived on your own. I go, but you can come live with me because I figure he's my dad and that's my responsibility regardless because I was the only kid who was still kind of talking to him. So I felt like I should say uh, something like that. So I said, you can come live with me. And it's as if when he heard that, he went, fuck that. <laughs> I'm going to with my dumb oh, kid. And no that, more living night, for me. that night he died. Wow. Wow. I'm going to try that. And, <laughs> and it's, it's weird to be sad that somebody died and also to take it a little personal. Yeah. I, yeah. It'd be hard to uh, not. It, yeah. it, it must have been very hard to invite anyone else to live with you after that. <laughs> That's true. No, I might not see them again. Oh, it was Rip so funny. Talk to the damn doctor. He's going to be fine. Done. Wow. So great. So <laughs> I, uh, I, so I listened to this. Uh, so the, oh, so this, the song we picked to we remind you. People. Yeah, we to yeah. remind you is we picked Scandinavian skies. It was actually suggested by uh, a listener suggested Scandinavian skies, and I. I don't know if I've ever heard this before. <laughs> it's entirely possible. It certainly was not a hit. Yeah. And I listened to it and my first thought was it sounds a little bit like Nielsen. Uh, Nielsen Schmielsen. Uh, <laughs> and then I was like, no, this is the Beatles. It's very Beatles-y. But it's very, to me, it's not just that it's the Beatles, but it's specifically a John Lennon tune. Yeah. And he's singing like Lennon. He's singing like Lennon. <laughs> of yeah, course. He is. And it feels like late Beatles or er so it could be, it could be, it sounds a little bit like late Beatles or early solo John Lennon, like double fantasy. Yeah. It's very, it, to me, I thought like, oh, this could fit right into like the White Album. Yeah. Um, or Sergeant Pepper's maybe. It's so bonkers. 
Uh, I mean, he definitely had a fetish for the Beatles and a lot of his songs sound like Beatles songs. Yeah. But none of, none of them really sound like late stage Beatles, like stage four Beatles. Right. The way this does. And, yeah. And uh, it, also I thought of uh, Bowie. It made me think like, oh, it's a little Bowie-ish. Yeah. But I guess a lot of Bowie comes out of that same psychedelic uh, movement. With the strings and the like, there's a weird accordion and some like um papa going on. There's a lot of weird stuff. It definitely, it sounds so little like a Billy Joel song. Yeah. And He's I, doing a weird voice. And I read a little it's bit about weird, it. Man. Yeah, I read a little bit about it because I was just like, what, what, what happened here? And, uh, and <laughs> He said in one, in one interview, he said it was it came out of an experience with heroin. And I saw the same thing. And isn't that one of the funniest things to try to picture is Billy Joel doing heroin? <laughs> yes. I wonder if, I would like more details on that. I want to know if he smoked it or shot it. I would bet he smoked it. Yeah. Um, which is kind of like smoking hash. Yeah. Um, it, I don't think it's anywhere near the same thing as shooting heroin. Um, and knowing what we know about him, I'll bet he did like a tiny bit. Yeah. But acted like he was really high. <laughs> and then was like, it also, this doesn't sound like heroin. This sounds like, you know, like I think of like Lou Reed, very stripped down, um, lyrically heavy, but not, this is like heavy composition. This is like the, whoever was working the soundboard was on something. Yeah. But I don't know about, <laughs> it's just a, it's a song about how shitty it is to tour in Europe. Yeah, and also think about the phrasing because the phrasing to me is funny and experience with heroin. Experience, yeah, so not necessarily even uh, that he had any heroin. He might have <laughs> just met somebody who was on heroin. Yeah, <laughs> or he literally did it once. And yeah, uh, like, did you smoke it or shoot it? And he goes, no, no, I had a heroin edible. <laughs> it was a pill. <laughs> I think they said heroin. They might, it might have, have been Bell. Might have been Advil. <laughs> <laughs> or it might have been so drunk already. Yeah. That they didn't affect me at all. Yeah. I mean, I I don't, you know, I don't mean to throw aspersions. If he says he did heroin, I'm sure he did. But it just Yes. He's a man of his word. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised to see that the song like was not released as a single, which is not the surprising part, but it somehow got to number 38 on the Billboard charts. Oh, wow. Okay. It's the top 40 song. So I could not believe it. John Lennon, by the way, famously wrote a song called Cold Turkey. Have you ever heard Cold Turkey? I have not. Cold Turkey is brutal because it's, it's got a lot of primal screaming on it. It's about quitting heroin. Aha. Uh -huh. So I would like there to be a Billy Joel song about him quitting heroin, which is the title of the song as well. I tried it once. It wasn't, wasn't that hard. <laughs> an, experience, an experience quitting heroin. Yeah. So I recommend, yeah. by the way, if for anybody, by the way, and for you, because you've recommended some nice songs, listen to Cold Turkey. It's an interesting song. Okay. Yeah. I have not. That's weird. I've not gotten into a lot of Lennon. Yeah. I went the other way, which is <laughs> I went. I listened to a lot of solo McCartney, um, which is not it's not heroin. It's uh, it's like uh, stevia, it's like, <laughs> like shooting up stevia or sweet and low. And you're like oh, you could do this. worse than listening to Paul McCartney. You know some of you know he he just he has powerful thoughts, but not about very many things. It's true. It's a, he uh, loves people. Yeah. <laughs> That's the main, seems to be the main thing. He liked his mom. He liked his dad. He liked it. He, his wife, he was delighted to have her with him. And then she passed away and he just is, is like, oh, I'll go on still having fun. 
I like vegetables. Yep. I'll eat salad. Everything. He's fine. Everything's fine with him. He's yep. a very nice man. Um, he did SNL once, and I remember um, this writer that I worked with, who was kind of a nerd, um, walked up to him and they said, "And said, hey, Mr. McCartney, I just have to tell you, I really love your music." And I cringed as hard as I could cringe, because don't he knows that <laughs> he has to hear that 500 times a day for 78 years or however old he is now. Um, but he very nicely said, ah, oh, you're a man of excellent taste. And I thought, oh, he must say that all to everyone all the time. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's just a nice way to handle that. Where yeah. you don't have to feel weird. The person doesn't have to feel weird. You made a little joke and off they go. And they, it's like, uh, you know, Steve Martin gives people a business card. Oh, you I know did about that. that? Um, he, when he wants to cut off a conversation with a fan, he has a business card that says, uh, you have just had a personal encounter with Steve Martin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's it. And you laugh and off he goes. Oh, that's cool. Um, so that was, uh, always fascinated by how people famous people handle especially super famous people who deal with it constantly how they handle that yeah it's weird because so paul mccartney and the, the beatles in general they at one point they talked about how they were like four elvises and anytime one of them went crazy the other person and they always felt bad for elvis because he was just alone because right. anytime one of them would get too big for their britches, the other ones would bring him down to earth. But now he's been famous for so long, he's got to figure it out. So he's just like, yep, this is just the yep, air I occupy. Yeah. yeah. And I think Billy Joel's got to be the same way. He's been famous for so long and a peculiar kind of famous because he's got a ton of fans who are like you and me, who are like, you're a fan, right? Yeah, yeah, love you. But you <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're fans with uh, notes. Yeah. We have notes. Um, Lauren always says about SNL, it's like, he's like, people get mad at SNL and they hate SNL because they feel like they own SNL. Because it's been on forever, it's part of their lives, and everybody feels like they have a say. Yeah. And he takes it as, as like, that's the ultimate achievement is when people feel like it's theirs and they can tell you what to do with it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yes, it's annoying sometimes, but it's also the final level. Yeah. I always think that of doesn't SNL. happen to uh, Susan. I always think of SNL like um, James Bonds in that there'll be a particular season that's yours and most of the time right. because you were 17. Yeah. Yeah, I have said that to people. They're like, it was better at this juncture. And I'm like, no, you were better. Yeah. <laughs> you were young and your body didn't look gross. Yeah. And that's why you liked it, because you were happier. Yep. And because <laughs> I, I'm a fan of comedy, but, but this is also too, too, like the new James Bond is actually my favorite because I just think they did a better thing with him. Uh, Craig uh, Kilborn. Kirk. <laughs> it's Craig Ferguson. It's Craig Ferguson, right? Yeah. I would watch Craig Ferguson as James Bond. That would be a good movie. I love that. Half of it would be nonsense improv. So <laughs> and that would be different how? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we've so I so I apparently we're on heroin because we haven't started yet, but that's all right. <laughs> Are we unconsciously putting it off a little? um maybe because they're weird lyrics but uh so first of all it does sound so much like the point or john lennon or david bowie and then let's take a look at the beginning of this the sins of amsterdam okay well then that must have been heroin he must have done heroin oh uh, right. yes well i'm that glad i read place. that other part because i'm like is this a political thing oh no it's just he got high <laughs> Yes, the political sins of Amsterdam. We're still a recent surprise. Okay, now, okay, so it was first, probably first and only time he did heroin because he didn't mean to do heroin. 
<laughs> oh yeah, maybe there was some rolled into a joint. Yeah. Is that a thing people do? Or he was he will well, he didn't go there meaning to do heroin. So oh uh, yeah, sure, I'll do this. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we're the sins of Amsterdam were still Amsterdam were still a recent surprise, and we were flying over Scandinavian skies. I just want to say, by the way, these this is how weird these lyrics are. The place where I always go to read the lyrics always has them like this is the first verse, this is the second verse. So there they'll be like line, 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 space, line, line. Right. This one has no spaces because whoever wrote them down went. I don't know what's supposed to be one and another. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> where one thought ends. It's all we, sort of one thought. And we were flying over Scandinavian skies. Um, um, I'm already, uh, again, over. You're flying over the sky. Oh, yeah. You're flying over Scandinavian land. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the thing again, where it's like, well, this sounds good when you sing it. Just don't think about whether or not it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I Fly guess- into Scandinavian sky. I guess there's a little bit of the sky underneath you, but most of it's above you. That's true. But that's too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's more of like a weed thought than a heroin thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You know, I'm thinking about like the sins of Amsterdam, like where he's on a plane, he did heroin the night before. <laughs> yeah. Feels like shit. And I'm sure drank a lot as well. Yeah. Um, and musically, I think it does sound like what a hangover feels like. Yeah, I can see that for sure. I don't know if that's what he was going for, but it does sound like you're going a little crazy with fatigue and substances, um, that crazy violin that's going on. And then there's like a snare drum that kind of goes on and off through the whole thing. It's very headachey. Yeah. It's like a, a really pretty headache, <laughs> the, whole, the whole song. Have you ever heard him do this live, by the way? No. I bet it's one of those that he's not happy about. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I ever have. And also, I feel like he'd have to bring in 15 more instruments to get it done. <laughs> oh, yeah, truly. Like, oh, where's the, I need the airplane sound effect. I need uh, an accordion. Yeah, and you're not going <laughs> to do this. Player. You're not going to finally do this live and go, OK, I'm going to do this song I've never done. But also, I'm going to do it stripped down, not the way on the album. Why would you do that? Yeah, no, no, this is the cool acoustic version. Yeah. I mean, oh, right, I wonder. Yeah. All right, you're up. Probably no one can come to it. We climbed towards the sun. We turned and cursed as one. We pulled the shades and closed our eyes. Yeah, hangover -y. Yeah. And we're all, and we're all hammered and that's, I, probably one of the only songs I can imagine it. I think this would be the only Billy Joel song where I think he's objectively referencing his band. I think you might be right. Yeah. Wow. That's like, actually, there's a lot of I and me and I'm the piano man. And yeah, but this, <laughs> this is the first time you hear him sound like he's part of a band. Oh, that's interesting. Cause I, there was some on the Billy Joel fan page the the, the Facebook group, somebody had mentioned, they mentioned so, some drummer saying so and so doesn't get enough credit, and I was like, "You're damn right he doesn't," because I'm not going to remember that name. It's the first time I've ever heard it. <laughs> um, there's a yeah. there's a guy I follow on Twitter, and I don't remember why I ended up following him because it wasn't intentional for this reason. But he's a guy who is, was currently a musician for Billy Joel. Oh. And he would just tweet experiences he had and loved Billy Joel. He was like, he couldn't right. believe how lucky he was because he's some session musician who now gets to go to Madison Square Garden and play. Great. But yeah, this would be the, I don't think, 
Can you even think of one other time he's referenced guys he's played with? I mean, there might be a time or two where he has said we. Yeah. But even that, I can't think of a specific one. Yeah. Um, well, a lot. It's a, a lot of his energy is directed outward <laughs> anyway. I guess if, what, if we say that he's saying that him and the band didn't start the fire, that would be the only other <laughs> Oh yeah, we, none of them did. It'd be a good time to introduce the band. Yeah. He also didn't start the fire on oh. base. Oh, Doug Stegmaier. This guy didn't start the fire. <laughs> uh, he's very good about, in concert at least, talking people up and sharing the credit. And he had a nice uh, little obituary on Twitter for Chick Corea. Who has done a lot of shows with him, weirdly enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this uh, this is the band on tour. Yeah. And this is also, I feel like there's a genre uh, that every artist sort of has one song about touring. Yeah. And being in the band and the guys in the band and, oh, it's hard to tour and we're all very tired. Yeah. But they're always sort of like stadium anthem rock songs. And this one is like such an obscure, weird little B-side art song. Yeah. It's so out of that genre. And maybe... I can't, my maybe, brain is broken, so I can't think of an example. Maybe what great is, in its own well. Well, like um, Beth, right? By... Uh, What's their yeah death? by Kiss by, by the Kiss like the the old Kiss army. Um, <laughs> what are another one? Oh, and that really whiny song by I don't know who, but I want to go home. Remember that song? Uh huh. Another baby, 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 shut up. <laughs> yeah, shut up. they always have the word another in them. Yeah. Oh, and very, uh, um, uh, there's another, the, the other big one with another in it, mm -hmm. another long haired hippie band. Ooh, what are those, the name of that? Yeah, another Serenader in another long haired band? Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, who is that? That's Billy Joel. No, 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 that's not what I'm thinking of then, because it's a... Uh, it's the song you're referencing with your backdrop. Yeah. What am I referencing? Uh, th that song that contains that lyric, another serenader in another long haired band, The Entertainer. That's right. Ah, I knew this one would be easy, but don't they all look delicious? <laughs> they actually do. I'm especially like the, third, the third on the top row I could go for. Yeah. Yeah. That was looks good. Yeah, baby. I'm a big beans and rice guy myself. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Those were the days. All right. So I think uh, you're the next lyrics. Oh, yes. What are the next chunk? The Stockholm city lights were slowly starting to rise, and we were strapped against those Scandinavian skies. Should I keep going? Yeah. The landing gear came down and touched the Swedish ground. <laughs> and we were all so paralyzed. It's, you know, I do appreciate um, finally having a Billy Joel song with a lot of place names in it that aren't streets in Manhattan. Right. Or boroughs or parks. Yeah. Um, it is interesting to hear him talk about Stockholm and Oslo. The Stockholm city, I mean, it's a very evocative uh, flight, flying image. Yeah. You've definitely like flown into a city when the city lights were just starting to rise and you know how it feels. It's fucking miserable. To, and no matter what you do, you're miserable if you land at that hour. Yeah, that, yeah, because you're gonna get out and it's cold. And there's no, well, whatever you're there to do, you can't do it yet. 
And if Did I tell you about the time? I got to tell you about this time. I uh, booked myself uh, a little three day vacation in Puerto Rico, right? Okay. So I booked it super fast on kayak. And I was like, great. Leaving at 1 p.m. Terrific. Didn't look at it again until the day before the trip. I was like, okay, let me look at this reservation. And I booked it for 1 a.m. <laughs> I booked a 1 a.m. flight from New York to Puerto Rico. Realized it at, I'm going to say 10 p.m. the night before. So three oh, wow. hours before the flight. Wow. So I was like, oh, shit. Do I cancel and rebook or do I cram stuff in a bag right now <laughs> and go to the airport? So I went, I was like, fuck it, I'll go. I wondered why it was so cheap. Um, and I got there just in time. And I was like, this is great. I'll be in Puerto Rico. I can check into the hotel. Wrong. You can't check into a hotel at 5.50 AM. Oh yeah, you can't. No. And when is your room ready? 3 p.m. <laughs> well, do they have any rooms that I can? No, there's no rooms ready. It's a very popular hotel. <laughs> but they were like, you can leave your bag here and uh, use the grounds. So I went and slept uh, by the pool on a pool chair <laughs> for as long as I could stand to sleep. Wow. Uh, until it was suddenly 90 degrees at 10 a.m. And then uh, I went to Burger King. <laughs> That's great. It was a great vacation. After that. After that, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, I've. Uh, <laughs> Kayak I've is so dangerous. It's too easy. It, you don't double check things. I've done that for comedy where I needed to book my own flight, and in order to make money, the flight had to be cheap. So I've done the thing where I'm like. My two choices are this flight where I'm late, well, I can't take that one, or this <laughs> one where I'm nine hours early. Yeah. Nine hours is a long goddamn time. <laughs> yeah, to walk around Omaha or yeah. some similar place. Yeah, one of the hotels I was at, I was, you know, you always, is it gonna be a good hotel? And then one of the hotels I was at, the um, number had fallen off the, my door so I, it took me a while to figure out what my room was. So I was pretty <laughs> sure it wasn't a good hotel. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a, one of the early signs. <laughs> oh, so I had to track it down by going, okay, that's that number. And they, and they skip, okay, so it's every, okay. It's only even numbers. Okay, so now I know what's going on now. <laughs> that was terrible. That was oh. absolutely terrible. <laughs> Uh, the Stockholm was, and we were strapped against. I like strapped against those Scandinavian skies. That's great. That's how I'm certainly uh, how it feels. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, the landing gear came down. Good. That's good. Yeah, you want that to happen. And touch, <laughs> touch the Swedish ground. That's. I mean, those two lines are maybe garbage. Yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe in case we didn't know where Stockholm was. Yeah. It is home of the syndrome, I think, right? Yeah, which might play into this a little bit. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the I, it might feel that way when you're touring. Yeah, for like, sure. I hate this, but I'm doing it. <laughs> is that, that's what that syndrome is, right? You do things you hate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think yeah. that's just life syndrome, right? I think that's what that is. Yeah, you do things you hate, and then uh, somebody invites you to live with them, and you decide to die. And you're like, that's one thing too many. <laughs> too many. Bye. On the plane, we were mainly sounds and lights in the veins. We could play the blues all night. Now, that's the, that weird little bridge, too. Yeah. On the plane. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing his little character. One thing I like that he does here, because he this this line we could play the blues all night will recur, uh, a spoiler for later, but in the lyric. But I do like, because again that one song, uh, I want to go home. I hate that song so much because <laughs> we I gotta find out what that song is. I, 
I don't care how hard you think touring is, and yeah, touring's hard, but you're a touring musician. Yeah, you'll never get sympathy from uh, an audience. Yeah. Touring. And tell you what, stop touring and go get a job. Oh, you don't want to do that? Then shut the fuck up. (laughs) And I... At a square garden once a month. And then, so I like the part where he says, and we could play the blues all night because it seems to be like touring's hard, touring's a pain in the ass. I like playing music. Yeah, it, I, I, felt, I, I couldn't decide if it would if it meant that, which I think it does. I think you're right, but it's also like we could also bitch and moan all night. Sure, was the other side of it, or maybe it is like we'll bitch and moan through the music because uh, if you're familiar with some of his music, there's a lot of bitching and moaning. Yeah, there is some complaint. Maybe it is like inspiration. <laughs> I'm like, good, I'll be good and pissy for all these songs tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I like that part where he's just at least acknowledging that it, touring can suck because it can. But um, you're still, I mean, hi, Sue. You're still a damn musician. <laughs> you're still getting paid to be a rock and roll star that everybody else wants to be. So, yeah, so cool it. Yeah, so man yeah. up. Yeah, it's complaining to audiences is never a good idea. Yeah. Comics also, same thing. The worst thing I see comics do, well, the worst thing is the things they get arrested for, but right. <laughs> the worst stage things is when they insult the venue or they're mad at the audience that they didn't think the joke was funny yeah, I'm the worst. Like that's their job isn't to think you're funny. Your job is to make them think you're funny. That's it. That's it. And you should know if you have any experience. If you have ten really funny jokes, seven of them will work. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> that's just the return you get. And do it in the right order, and actually, they'll all work. <laughs> yeah, you can get higher percentages depending on what you do. Not them. You have to do it. Yep. I've always said the hardest set to do in my, in my opinion, the hardest set to do is 10 minutes. That's a tough. Yeah. The, the easiest set to do in my opinion is 45. Right. 45 is magic because you're, you didn't have to fill an hour. So you still could just go out with a material. You just still hitting the strong jokes but a half hour in they like you they're now your friend they're like they want you to succeed yeah stockholm syndrome yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i can but you have time to build the relationship yeah i can do jokes at minute you know like minute 25 minute 30 i can do jokes that if i did it minute five they'd go who are you to say this but right but in minute 30, they're like, ah, you're my friend. Say what you will. Yeah, that's a little weird that you say. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You're lucky I know you. <laughs> to be offended. <laughs> All right. The tour of Germany was bleeding into our eyes, which I like. I like that too. And we were sailing again over Scandinavian skies. I do like, yeah, the tour, obviously they've just left Germany and now they're going to do the, the Scandi circuit, uh, as we call it in the biz. Yeah. Um, but obviously that was rough. And then we hear in this next verse, we, <laughs> we had the Midas touch until we met the Dutch. <laughs> they exhausted our supplies. Um, I'm sure you know the Dutch are famously difficult audiences. Yeah. Um, Seth uh, worked at an improv theater in Amsterdam for a couple of years, as did uh, Amber Ruffin and a few other comedians we know. Ike Barinholtz was there. Yeah. And they always tell stories about audience members coming up to them after the show 
and some guy came up to Seth after a show and he was like, ah, yeah, you're the guy from the show. Uh, let me buy you a beer. And so he bought him a beer and Seth was like, oh, thank you very much. So you like the show? And the guy went, no, it was not very good. <laughs> But uh, you work very hard. I'd like to buy you a beer. <laughs> so it was just like, can you imagine? Right to your face. <laughs> no, not very good. But like jovial. I'm not holding it against you. It was like, no, it was not good. But you work very hard. Oh, that's um, they are tough. I, th you know, I think if they love stuff, they really love it. But they don't ever pretend to like things. Yeah. And I think they'll like come backstage and tell you, <laughs> you know, like we leave. Like if you go to a friend's play and it stinks, you leave and you text them the next day. Like, uh, how'd you feel about it? Yeah. <laughs> or how do you learn all those lines or whatever? Yeah. But you don't go, man, you, that was a bad play that you were in. <laughs> uh. um, they don't waste a lot of time on that kind of stuff. I also remember being in Copenhagen with um, working on something for Justin Timberlake, but uh, somebody I went with had a friend who lived there, this uh, lady who was a doctor. And so she took us out to dinner, which is very nice. She was very polite. And halfway through the conversation, she just like put her hands on the table and she's like, excuse me, um, do you always talk about your feelings all the time? <laughs> Everybody was like, what? It's like, yes, uh, most of uh, what you were talking about is uh, the way you feel about various things. And we were like, uh, I guess so. I guess that is what we do. And then it was like, okay. And it, very nice, paid for dinner, hung out with us the next night. And I was like, oh, that was a weird observation. That's definitely true. And we did spend a lot of time being like, what else would you talk about? Politics and stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, it was just a, yeah. weird observation. That's definitely true and very Scandinavian. I guess you have to be practical when it's zero degrees all the time. So in when she would talk, do you recall what she would talk about? You know, she would tell you, yeah, she would kind of tell you what was happening. This is what I do. This is when I do it. I do this other thing. She would talk a lot about how great the government was and how they took care of the citizens. Um, she was, you know, a doctor and she worked 36 hours a week <laughs> and never worked more than that. And we would be like, aren't you on call? And she's like, no, we, we don't have on call. I don't know what this is. Oh, wow. If you are working, you are working. If you're not working, then you are not. Okay. So she would like fill us in on how much better life could be. But she didn't say, oh, wow, that's interesting. She didn't say how she felt about that. She just said how it was. These are how things are. What I feel about it does not matter so much. <laughs> I guess that's a, you could look at it that way. That's very interesting. I guess, well, you know, what the fuck? What do I know? I guess that's a cultural thing. Wow, that's wild. That is wild. Yeah, I I think I maybe have told you this. I always find it interesting to see to see somebody else in their own culture. My sister married this lovely Muslim man from Pakistan, and uh, he's always he's a very reserved person. He's just a very reserved, quiet person. He's very thoughtful in what he has to say. And then one time I saw him with a bunch of friends who also speak Urdu. Mm -hmm. He was a different guy. <laughs> and he was, he gesticulated more. He was, he was laughing. He was telling stories to them. And, right. and that was the trade off to marry my lovely sister was to have to live forever in the second language you're not 100% comfortable with. I'm astounded when people can do that. Yeah. Because uh, I took nine years of French and I can still count to 10 and name like three vegetables and I'm out. Yeah. It's amazing to me that people can do that. Yeah, it doesn't make a lick of sense to me either. My brain won't do it. 
I've tried. I think I told you this. I may no. I don't think I told you this. I was when I was when I finally went to college. I decided I'd take a language, and I decided that I was going to learn Japanese. <laughs> right. So I came into class, and I was so <laughs> ill prepared that apparently I had I had signed up for like intermediate Japanese. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know the basics. Yeah. So I, I sat down and the teacher started talking in Japanese. I was like, okay, well, I, I understand she's talking in Japanese. Pretty soon she'll say something in English when she starts teaching me stuff. Oh, no, she's not going to do that. Wow. And everybody around seemed like they knew what was going on. And all I knew was I was like, well, I'm getting an F. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Did you keep going? I went three times <laughs> and never right. felt comfortable. And I never felt like this was for all Did I knew. Like it was sinking in by the third class. Yeah. I, no. For all I knew, they could have been plotting stuff. <laughs> I was so uncomfortable. Oh, my God. That's so when, and of course, dumb me, I don't take a Spanish class where at least English and Spanish are no, no, it's harder than it has to be. Yeah, I was like, let's yeah. pick a language that has nothing in common with my language. Yeah. Has has sounds I'm not going to be capable of making for a long time. Has concepts that won't fit. <laughs> right. It's different. It's different. written. It's different. It's a whole different writing system. Yeah. Oh goodness. I well, I took French, which was like this is great. I can when I grow up, I can be a businessman who goes to France. <laughs> business. Uh, it didn't work. And uh, I learned recently uh, when you go to France, they all speak English. And they don't want you to speak bad French. And every, Sue and I would sit down at a, a table in a restaurant and we'd be like, oh, bonjour. And they'd go, no, nah, and hand us menus in English. And they'd be like, uh, American, OK. Yeah, I speak. It's good. Uh, what can I get for you? And, uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ, your vocabulary is better than ours. So there's no reason to take any foreign language, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. You want to take this next part? Yeah, let me read this next part. Um, yeah, this who's, could be in French. Who's to pay? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Who's to pay for this international flight? Who could stay? We were only there for the night. Yeah, yeah I get that. I've done that too. The one nighter is hell for I don't care what you do. One yeah. nighter. You've done, have you done, you've done some one-nighters of something, right? Yeah, I've done, um, not so much working, like definitely going to the Emmys and flying back the same night and yeah. doing the show the next morning. It was a little hellish. Yeah, I've done a, in stand-up it happens a lot where you'll put a run together, right? So it'll be a one-nighter followed by a one-nighter that's like say 50 miles away or hundred miles away or something like that. And it, uh, it'll it'll hurt you after a while. Yeah. I still, again, I always go back to though that I'd rather do that than most anything else. So I'm uncomfortable bitching about it too much because at the end of the day, you got to do what you do. Right. And so, and also, you know, if you were a touring musician and you're like, oh, this damn international flight. So you're on an international flight going to have people watch you do rock and roll okay i'm i'm sure you're tired <laughs> right and i i respect that but come on but and oddly enough considering how much we talk about how billy joel complains a lot this isn't that complaining considering what he's talking about it's true this just feels like a more uh not complaining so much as just accurately stating yeah how difficult it is yeah it's like, yeah, it's difficult. And here's why. And this is how we felt. 
Yeah. But none, there's no like, I don't want to do this. I, don't, I want to go home. I'd rather tour the US. <laughs> it's just like, it's hard. And, you know, I happen to know a few musicians who toured Europe with their own bands in the in like 80s and 90s. And they're all hell stories. It's just not the same. Like venues don't treat the artists the same way there. Yeah. Um, here there's definitely, you know, there's a feeling like you have to treat all the artists as well as you can or as well as you can afford to so that they'll come back and they'll tell their fellow artists. Yeah. And it seemed like there they were like, we have the venue. Fuck you. <laughs> you need us. So uh, no, we're not getting you green M&Ms. Get your own M&Ms. Yeah. <laughs> from what I gather from these people, that <laughs> is a more common approach. Yeah. <laughs> That's then again, these friends I have were not in bands that were nearly as big. Yeah, I think about that oftentimes. Like being a traveling comic, big or small, is easy compared to having a drum kit. That's oh god. Yeah, at least you just have to show up with your skinny ass and they yep. give you a stool and a glass of water, right? Yep, you're in. You're I remember in. doing a show where there was also a band and uh, but it was a better better show because it was more like we both had two different shows, same stage. Not We weren't part of the same yep. show. And I remember the show being oh, over yeah. and looking at the stage and there's the damn drummer. I'm like, the show's <laughs> been over for a while. He's unscrewing things and like oh yeah they have to build their whole <laughs> contraption yep and then nobody uh gives them respect nope everybody wants to have sex with the guitar player yeah who just has, he just has to unplug it and put it in a case yeah well, that's probably why he has more time for sex i'm for sure that's got to be part of it yeah absolutely think the drummer's not out of there till one in the morning and then he's like oh, my hands are tired yeah <laughs> wing nuts too many wing nuts what's his name from snl who did a comedy special of comedy for drummers oh yeah great. fred armison fred armison i really enjoyed that it was really fantastic yeah he, he has a great weird brain yes he really does um let's see uh who would pay for this international flight well i think you guys will yeah you are uh Phil Ramon yeah. or Phil Silvers, whoever's running that thing. Yeah, <laughs> running Phil that Silver, thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in Europe, I think. Um, we watched the power fall inside the Oslo Hall while all the cold Norwegians cried. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like a true story that must have happened on this tour. Yeah like the made the power or the heat or something went out in this hall because for him to say hall yeah it was interesting obviously i mean maybe just for the rhyme but i'm like oh he definitely played like a hall he didn't play a stadium yeah. <laughs> in oslo yeah he got the couple thousand people who would come maybe i also like in the song that as soon as he says uh Stockholm, then he has to say Swedish ground. And as soon as he says Oslo, he has to mention the cold Norwegians. He's very good about teaching geography. Oh yeah. It's like, this is the country that that city is in, by the way. Yeah, this could be an Animaniac song. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite peppy enough, but yeah. All the cold Norwegians cried. Who could say what was left and where was right? That seems like deliberately obtuse phrasing. For sure, I'm not sure. That feels like uh, this, uh, I bet this is what Lenin would do. And he's probably right. He wouldn't say where twice. Well, yeah, that's true, he wouldn't do that. And by the way, I could play the blues all night. Yeah. It's maybe, uh, it's the only phrase that's repeated, isn't it? Yep. And it's repeated exactly once. And for Scandinavian skies. Yeah. And it made me think, that's what affirmed to me that I think he's just talking about, man, 
this sucked. This was cold. This was dumb. But I could play the blues all night. I just like playing music. I guess he. I'm trying to figure out. Probably at this point in his career, most of what he was playing is blues or bluesy. Yeah. It is a weird way to refer to his own music. <laughs> so I don't think he thinks of himself as a blues artist. Yeah. But then what do you say? I could play the catalog all night. I could play the hits. I could play the hits would have been a good lyric. It would have been a night. Nice... It might be, yeah. Yeah. The blues all night. Yeah, it, it is sort of like, weirdly, one of his more upbeat songs in a way. Yeah. Usually it's just everything is shitty and this girl doesn't like me <laughs> or is stuck up or something. Yeah. Uh, and this one is like, well, everything is shitty, but you get to play my songs all night. I'm a musician. I'm a musician. Yeah. Um, I'm several musicians. <laughs> right now I'm John Lennon. Sometimes I'm Sting. <laughs> or Nilsson Schmilson. Sometimes I'm black. <laughs> Sometimes I'm black. Sometimes I'm Italian. <laughs> Chameleon. Yeah. I'm a he's Italian a lot. He's definitely Italian. He's Italian a lot. And uh, never Jewish in songs, but always Jewish. God damn right. He's one of ours. That's right. We love you, Bill. He, uh, I watched, um, what did I watch? I did watch, I was watching some concert footage. I just find it funny to see his fat fingers just crushing it, just being great. It's amazing to me that he can play an octave <laughs> with yeah. those hands. It's unreal. And he was a boxer for a while, right? Yep. Like it's everything. Uh, he does not seem like a pianist at all. Yeah, for sure. And it's great. Yeah. And he's still, you know, in, in as much as that Bruce Springsteen wants to be and is to a degree, but I'm like, Billy Joel actually is working class, even though he's a lot of money now, but he's, he really is a working class dude. He Yeah, sort of in his bones. He 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 can't keep money once he gets it. No. Nope. Can't keep a wife. No. Nope. <laughs> Lives on Long Island. And could live anywhere. Could live somewhere nice. Yep. But he lives on Long Island instead. Yep. Take that long. <laughs> and but still keeps on plugging. Yeah. God bless him. Yeah. I just was researching trivia questions and I learned that he had a double hip replacement <laughs> 10 oh, years wow. ago, um, which makes sense. Um, I'm sure the lifestyle is not easy on the hips. No, when he had the car accident, that probably didn't help. It didn't help? Good, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what oh, trivia God. question did you come up with me that, uh, or was that it really quick? <laughs> no, that was not it. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I think, in 1999. By whom? Oh. Elton John. No. Somebody a little closer to home for him musically. Okay. I'm just dragging it out a little bit. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> oh, Ray Charles. Oh, yeah. Wow, that is cool. Do I you... think, yeah. I remember he, uh, you know, that song he did with Ray Charles, Baby Grand, yeah. um, which is great and also cheese ball. Um, but he tells the story of meeting Ray Charles. And what he said was, it was like meeting the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> this is a really weird thing to say. <laughs> Because that doesn't seem like, I mean, I guess if you were a, an immigrant in the 1700s or whenever the statue showed up, the 1800s. I still get it, gonna... though. I still get it, though, because 
I get, I get what he was going for, but it was a weird thing to say. Yeah. Like meeting an inanimate object. Yeah. <laughs> the baby, yeah, baby grand. I'm not sure how I feel about that song. I listen to it because it's two great guys singing a song together. But it's such a only one of them is doing an impression of the other one. <laughs> yeah. Now <laughs> that would have been an incredible song if Ray Charles tried to do a Billy Joel impression too. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would have enjoyed that a lot. It would have been great. Because there's sure. while there's 10 or 15 Billy Joel songs where he's doing a Ray Charles impression. Yeah, for sure. And this it had to have been a dream come true. It's that whole thing, though, of anthropomorphizing the piano. And, yeah. And I'm like, it's a little over the top. And if so Ray Charles, what did think of it this way? If Ray Charles had just done that song and you didn't know who wrote it, I wonder, I think I would like it. I think, yeah. It'd be a lesser Ray Charles song, though. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. And, yeah, you'd be I, like, oh yeah, I I would forgive the anthropomorphizing. Yeah, and it feels like it feels like the idea of doing a duet came before the idea of the song, and I don't like that. Oh yeah, or I think like maybe writing the song was like a way to meet Ray Charles. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're like yeah. Because he does say that he wrote it and then sent it to him. Okay. It doesn't yeah. sound like he, it doesn't sound like you would write the song and go, oh, you know who this would be great for. That's not what happened. <laughs> yeah, no, he didn't realize it later. <laughs> yeah. It was, you You coldly calculated and good for you. You got to work with Ray Charles and that's. You did, but yeah. Yeah. It's accomplished. Like, it's like that ridiculous duets album of Sinatra's. Where oh, yeah. thing with Bono. Yeah. Well, that's what uh, he did with the bridge, which is what that was from. And okay. but he got to do, but he ended up singing with like Ray Charles and then Cindy Lauper, okay. And the dude from Traffic, what is his name? Steve Winwood? I was gonna say Bushemi because I'm not good at stuff. <laughs> You're bad at that stuff. <laughs> And then there's a lot of songs in there that aren't duets. And you're like, okay, uh, what were you doing? Yeah. You had half an idea. Half an idea is a, is a, is a starting point and the ending point for a lot of songs, but. <laughs> <laughs> it truly is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny that you do have that background um, evocative of the lyrics from the entertainer um, because that uh, was also about touring and it was a little more upbeat. Yeah. But also a little bitchy. Yes, for sure. And um, contained a lot of his deep seated insecurities, like the fear that he would be end up in the discount rack, like another can of beans. Like another can of beans. Which I, I thought when I first heard the song was a band. Because it didn't make sense to me that beans would be in a discount rack. Yeah. A bin I, or a shelf. So I thought, oh, there's probably a band called Can of Beans that I've never heard. Yeah. That's before I knew about his lyrical weirdness. <laughs> and I first heard it on, uh, do you remember albums? Yeah. The record store albums. Uh, my friend Sam went over there and he found an album by a band called Mirror Image, which was a Billy Joel cover band. Um, that, and their whole thing was not like to change it and make it more interesting. It was to sound as, as much as possible exactly like the song. <laughs> <laughs> so we listened to that because we thought it was hilarious. And that's where I heard The Entertainer and played the grooves off of it because like, it's, a, it's a bop. Yep. Um, and forgot about it until I bought, what is it, Street Life Serenade, I think it's on? Yeah, I think that's right. And I was like, oh, fuck, this song, great. <laughs> yeah. It's not much of a story, but it sure ended. Yeah, 
<laughs> Good job. I, I, <laughs> I got I, the mix of it. The Entertainer, by the way, we may have mentioned this before, but there's a longer version of it, and there's a radio edit of it, and the radio edit is 305. It's 305. And good job for following through and making that happen. Yes. Because I... I it was not an accident. It couldn't have been an accident. No, no. And I like stuff like that. I, I, I'm all down with like overly self-aware nonsense like that. That's entertaining to me. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's fan awareness. Fans yeah. like shit like that. And yeah. I, the Beatles were the best at it. Oh, who's the walrus? Is Paul dead? And they're like, mm. yeah, yeah. I don't know. Figure it out, man. Get back to us. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I like fan service in general, which is all, you know, all Marvel movies because I'm the right guy for those movies. There's just fan service, fan service constantly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're watching WandaVision, I assume. Oh, hell yes. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. My buddy, uh, who is from Long Island, uh -huh. he, uh, he got into Marvel, Marvel movies from starting from Iron Man, but he didn't know the comics. And oh, wow. one of the things he likes to do is he likes to watch the movie and then go out to dinner with me and quiz me about the comics. So he'll ah. say, so you, this thing they did, did that come from the comics? And then I'll give him a background. Great. And it's weird. Because <laughs> doesn't that sound like that conversation should start the other way? I start talking about it and he doesn't want to hear about it. But he's quizzing. Right. It's glory. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So this. Yeah, water, have, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say the WandaVision thing is like we go to dinner. He says, so I tell him all about Wanda Maximoff. And I'm like, he's, I haven't lost him. This is crazy. He's interested in this weird conversation. <laughs> I have a, a trainer, a personal trainer who is a, a real Marvel head. Um, who does the opposite bad thing, which is tell me what everything means, even though I don't care. <laughs> so I told him, I was like, oh, I'm watching WandaVision. I watched a couple so far. And he's like, the hexagonal shape is very important. And I was like, uh-huh, okay. Like, yeah, it really pays off. Like, All right, I believe you. It seems like it's well-organized. I'm sure everything pays off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they give you, he'll tell me about movies I haven't seen. <laughs> Great. Oh God. Ah, so that happens in it, huh? Cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, for next week, I think uh, it's my turn to choose, right? Yes, it is. I'm going to bring it back to New York. Um, I didn't. I just love this song. I haven't heard it in a long time and you listen to it today. It's great. And it's close to the borderline. Close to the borderline. Awesome. And I don't think I've listened to it in a long time. It's a good old fashioned song about when New York was uh, gritty and shitty and uh, Fran Leibowitz ruled the world. <laughs> Fran Leibowitz, <laughs> is that what you said? Yeah. It's Fran's New York. That's awesome. She still should rule the yeah. world. Oh, yeah. I think she might still do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you watched that show at all? No, I've heard good things. Um, I it's very to, enjoyable, especially if you live here. Yeah. I have to be very judicious in what I choose to, go, to get into because I have a terrible attention span, so I got to go, okay, will I stay with this? Yeah. Uh. Like, I think I told you, I just watched Breaking Bad. <laughs> right. And I finished it, and uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's real good. It's the best show there is. Yeah. I tried more than once to get Sue to watch it, um, and she doesn't like it because nobody's nice. Walt Which, Jr.'s pretty nice. Who is? Walt Jr. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, you could get into the Walt Jr. storyline. <laughs> yeah, that could be your whole reason for watching. Uh, she's a real Walt Jr. head. So then, then 
ah, don't spoil it for her, but eventually he gets his own car. <laughs> it's a two-parter. <laughs> uh, well, when he gets his spinoff series, yeah, <laughs> we'll be down with that. I uh, After the series was over, I decided to watch interviews. All yeah. The, the best ones, so many on Conan. Apparently, just Conan was a maniac about the show. Right. So... So next week we'll talk about Breaking Bad. No, we'll talk wait, wait, about what? close to the borderline in episode sixteen coming 16. up. Sweet sixteen. Thanks for tuning in, everybody who's still tuning in. I appreciate you. <laughs> it's amazing.